African hospital. It was Dr. Craig. We celebrate him. So I think this is something I would like the state. Create situations where our brain, our specialists, can provide services globally and yet remain here. And I think that is something we need to interrogate and promote as a policy matter and a practice. That in the case of Uganda, I think my problem, like you have correctly observed, is the issue of policy. And you have set the standard law. For example, in Uganda, a teacher of biology is now considered a scientist. And he earns more. Since when did somebody teaching biology, physics, and chemistry in a high school become a scientist? But that's how low we are. And that's what we hope to export. So I think the, 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 the issue of building our uh, the brain, developing the brain, creating opportunities for the brain exercise is important. Two is that there is some developing practice in Uganda which I like, where our specialists operate globally but have refused to leave home. A good example to me is we have uh, an orthopedic specialist in our region, it's Dr. Kure, and uh, he operates globally. He's a visiting doctor in South Africa, everywhere, but he has not left the country. Can we encourage that kind of thing? Can we create so that we may be able to retain our brain without pushing it to the drain? And I think to me that is critical. And Dr. Kure is interesting. One time, somebody refused to be operated in this place, and they flew him to South Africa. So when he reached South Africa, they told him we have. It affects us, especially in terms of domestic resource mobilization. We lose a lot in terms of taxes, and we have the skilled workers, you know, contributing to these various economies where they sit up. So I was. Uh, I mean, we see interns are striking, teachers are striking, lecturers are striking, engineers are striking, and these are some of the factors that are pushing these skilled workers to leave the country. So my question directly goes to the minister, to the, uh, the person to the Ministry of Labor. Are we doing anything as a country to make uh, the, our employment for these different skilled workers thrive such that they do not have to work, and then in turn we do not say people are striking, nurses are striking. I think the whole thing is about, say, the whole government structure. Uh, you have been hearing of the issues of rationalization and so on. How are the, the, the workers of essential services uh, treated or remunerated? I think there must be a deliberate policy uh, of uh, rewarding the categories in essential services and, and so on and so on. But the, currently, we do not have a structured, maybe, as I can I call it, a salary system. Even the Minister of Labor, actually, cannot do much as regards the salaries paid to either government workers and so on. So it has to be cabinet as in a whole has to come up and address the issues of wages for nurses, doctors, uh, teachers, and so on. Uh, so it, it is not a Ministry of Gender. It's actually, in my view, it's a national crisis. It has to be addressed as that. Otherwise, the Ministry of Labor, as a ministry, may not do much because it does not determine the salaries. First of all, we do not have a law on the minimum wage any data, any current data on um, how many of those skilled manpower or skilled highly professional professionals within the country who would really be very helpful in uplifting our economy? We don't have data. I think it's one area the ministry needs to think about building a data profile. Because if you have like 40% of the doctors in Botswana, Ugandan doctors, 30% you doctors in, uh, in South Africa, about 25% Ugandan doctors, if you have 25% teachers in Rwanda as Ugandan teachers, so it has an effect on uh, the quality of our education, it has an effect on the quality of our health, 
capital for the future. And I think for me, we need to have clear frameworks. If we have to negotiate opportunities, if someone needs doctors and there's value that comes back to the economy, we need to rethink that as, as, as well. I think my closing um, um, you know, point would be, if we continue having an open door where, for example, in Makere, 30% of those who go to study for PhDs don't return. It has an effect on the future quality of advice or policies or development programs or oversight on some of these other issues. Because you're losing the top brains, and yet you need these top brains if you want to strategically position yourself for the future. And, and lastly, for me, the issue of academic freedom vis-a-vis -vis losing the top professors just because you are pushing for the culture of silence. You don't want people who are speaking against um, the statecraft or the state, and because of that you don't care and you lose out the best people who would actually have provided the best guidance intellectually. And lastly is, some of us who both study abroad come back here, what we see is the culture of mediocrity. You know, I am back, I have a PhD, but no government agency can take me in. Because the sister and the daughter and the other person who is in there, you're comfortable having your close person in there, but the quality of the experience, the quality of the governance. Um, my colleagues who have studied with some of us in Delaware are advising our PSs, our ministers. But then you come back to Uganda, you either have to go into research or something else. This intellectual iniquity will in the near future affect those who aspire to study to be like these doctors. Because they don't see opportunities and their futures appreciated in the country. Thank you very much. Independence of the judiciary. The judiciary should be able to adjudicate a case on the basis of the facts and the law. Uh, we know that uh, the independence is one uh, on the basis of appointment and security of tenure. Uh, we know that the judiciary has worked on the, the, the security of tenure by increasing the facts, but we still have the issue of appointment. Uh, Dr. T.K. successfully petitioned the Constitutional Court in the issue of acting justices. What have we seen? We've seen the Supreme Court say implementation of that decision. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court, like many of you know, has not had a constitutional appeal for almost three years now. The Supreme Court, which gave us Chibula, which gave us the Sebub case, which gave us all other uh, Unyango Bo, has not had an appeal arising from some of the constitutional decisions for over three years. What that means is that the good constitutional court cases that have come, uh, like we have two judgments of the Constitutional Court on trial of civilians in the court martial. They have been stayed, awaiting the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, acting justices have been stayed, awaiting. Now, that is a threat in itself to litigation. But then the other issue is the, the environment. Sometimes, uh, like we mentioned, that um, we, have, we have the Human Rights Assessment Act, which says that if I'm complaining over, uh, 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 I have a torture complaint, I can walk to a magistrate and raise my complaint. And the magistrate is supposed to reduce that in writing, in whatever language I use. Where have we seen, why, why is it that despite the increment in torture cases that we see, we don't see those decisions coming through, we don't see those cases registered. Partly it's because of the political environment. So for successful litigation, uh, it has to be mindful of the environment. We have cases uh, under the Human Rights Enforcement Act which are pending hearing in the High Court for the last two years. Never mind that the legislation says it has to be decided in six months. For two years, we are waiting for a hearing. People are only rolling. So we have to look at all those factors that affect. And then the competence of the lawyers. Uh, it requires resources. Uh, uh, it requires uh, lawyers who are competent to good public investigation. We can talk about the issue of uh, half-hearted litigation, which ultimately gives us bad decisions. So I think that we need to look at all those factors. And part of the reason why it has not worked because of the enabling factors around it, but we have the law, we have co the, the, the competence, it's just the environment which affects that. Thank you so much, George. And, and BK, George preempted my question to you. you. You've tried knocking at these courts. You've left your classroom and gone to these courts and you've knocked at the doors. And of recent, there is... Okay, I, I, I think... I think you touched on the number of big cases, and I'm grateful to Susan and George for raising um, quite a number of also interesting angles. I think one of the challenges that are arising from the court, and 
And, and here, be very careful because it, it's one thing to be in the classroom, go there yourself, and you can say whatever is in your mind. It's quite another where you're interacting with the course because it's a repeat, it's, it's a repeat engagement. And so something you say here might be, I hope they get further engagement. But I think as, as careful as I can, I, I think there, there, there are some challenges, especially um, when it comes to questional matters. I'm not too sure that the court effectively recognizes the difference between uh, matters in personam and matters in rem. The idea that ordinary litigation, you are representing a client who is named. And that in public interest litigation, the, the, client, the client is the constitution itself. That, that you talk about this act that violates the constitution. So that you really don't have, for instance, the question has come up as to whether a petition that can also be counseled. And that can happen in public interest litigation because there, there's a difference, ideally, between the status as petition. I think the answer is in the question we have just posed. Because if we are being told to steer clear of political discourses and engagements when we are discussing human rights, then that means that the best or the alternative um, avenue for us as human rights advocates is the courtroom. And, um, but then again, <laughs> like, like Professor Vick has pointed out the quick run examples, when you get to the courtroom, mm -hmm. you will still find politics there. Mm -hmm. And I want to just um, make that point demonstrating. Earlier on when, um, when the Honorable Minister was giving his keynote address, he mentioned that very soon the constitutional challenge, the case that is challenging the constitutionality of the Antony Security Act, may be had before Christmas, right? Of course, I'm not saying that is an official position, but the fact that that is something that is on the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 symbolic really symbolic. Um, the, the false hope that you know you're, you're, you're changing something or that you're disrupting, but the structures, the structural drivers of oppression are left intact. So um, that is one. Number two, I think when you use public interest litigation, you are really using the proverbial, proverbial master's tools to dismantle the master's house. So you go, you run to the law, and you will have um, the oppressive section within the Equal Opportunities Commission Act, you know, being um, rendered unconstitutional, and you pop champagne, you're very happy, and the same state will use the same tool law to enact the Anti-Homosexuality Act. So in that sense, I think we should forget about Peel, we should forget about this liberal you know, law that is enacted within a liberal, Western liberal framework, because the truth is it, it is not going to engender any social transformation. Is first and foremost, is it possible for citizens up county like Westman to benefit, benefit from it? What are the infrastructure required to have effective uh, strategic litigation? When I look at situations like the courts, you have a region of about 30, of 3 million people, and being served by one high court maybe three or four chief magistrate courts. In other words, people are already struggling to get the normal justices and now going into public interest. We talked about the lawyers who are needed to do this. We talked about their capacity. And uh, you may find in our area people are still struggling with the integrity because now that's a place where, first of all, the few lawyers willing to go and work and if you are there actually cheat the community a lot, when they are successful, for them. So, is public interest 
computers are uh, not really going to be more far-fetched. Probably you will need, and therefore my last comment is, if this is a true human rights situation, we have so many organizations supporting human rights initiatives. And uh, there are lawyers who could probably do this. Why don't we support lawyers to, to litigate the interests of public if human rights institutions are out there to serve the interests of the public? To me, that should be one of the things we should be complaining that lawyers have no money to do this because some money, some are people are capable of doing something for the population. George putting on a red tie. And a red tie that has loud overtones of what? Of politics. From where I stand, have the courts, of course, might see the biased question, have the courts been human to your politics that you decided to carry the courts? Well, uh, my red tie, I'm a supporter of the Express FC and Manchester United. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> as a biased question, well, um, the duty of courts is to listen to each and every person before them and adjudicate fairly in accordance with the law. Uh, there, there is a tendency, and, and uh, it, it's always something I always tell uh, even uh, my colleagues in the media, the, the tagging of human rights violations to political causes. There is a tendency to say, no missing people, as if these are not Ugandans, as if no business persons. And then they say, these are political cases. There are no political cases. I always tell people there are no political cases. I, you only take cases because you have a cause of action, which you go to court. If court feels that there is no legal issue, then court can should throw out that case on the outright. The, 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 the challenge where, uh, and uh, where Arthur's question, I think, is coming from is that increasingly there are very few, uh, I earlier mentioned that public investigation needs uh, lawyers. Uh, who are competent. And because of the environment and the democratic decline that Dr. BK talks about, uh, it has increasingly pushed so many competent lawyers out of public interest matters. And uh, at one time I was teasing my brother, the president of ULS, uh, Bernard, that you have a, a society of over 4,000 registered members. You need to give me 20 public interest lawyers. And I, I'm sure no one in this room can name them often. Why? It's because people have been pushed away, either by the risks, or uh, actual or perceived, or by the processes and the bureaucracies that you take a matter to court and you let the state over it, you seek a remedy for over 20 years, 10 years, 5 years. So uh, it, it has left uh, some of those cases uh, to a few people, uh, and of course, even that in itself is a violation, because you need more hands on board. Uh, it, 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 uh, sadly, even some judges have been labeled as such. There are some judges, uh, among so many lawyers' groups, and we all know that there are some judges who have been labeled as political judges, so, which, which I'm saying it's sad because lawyers, judges should handle matters and courts should adjudicate matters on the basis of the law and evidence. When political overtones come up, like it, the country avoided because human rights are political issues, uh, sometimes the, the violators or the victims have political colors. Yeah, it's, so there's a huge tendency to name them. But for the courts, for purposes of the courts, courts should go on to make pronouncements. Because, because in any case, a good pronouncement doesn't look for colors. We all studied Semogere cases. Uh, Semogere was advocating for possibly a political party, but they opened up spaces for so many things. So the, 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 the reason why colors have been painted is because, one, there are fewer hands on board, and then the tendency for people to label either victims or aggressors from a particular color, but we should not tra lose track. That should not let us lose track of the main issue. The essence should be, do these people have a legal case or not? Uh, to end, uh, for those who have not read, I still uh, refer to him, this is a panelist, Dr. Pinkley, wrote a, a very good piece in today's Observer regarding human rights and money, and says that, uh, and it's instructive in this debate we're having, that for people who are handling uh, human rights issues, and here we should add public interest cases. The question should be, can you still do it if, 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 if no money is given to you? I'm paraphrasing. 
When we go to the court martial and we spend the whole day there, I, I don't know how many people have lawyers have seen the court martial. I wouldn't even want to call it a court. Uh, at one time, it was handling uh, General Kazini, the late. I remember Mr. Justice now, my drama was a lawyer representing one of the incidents. And it had the chairman, General Tumwini, who would appear at court at 4 p.m. And these lawyers would be there from 9 a.m. waiting for the chairman to arrive at 4. I don't know how much money you can give me to go there if I'm begging for money to go and spend the whole day waiting there. As and I were in the trenches going in the one with Navy now. In 2016, when we were trying to, to prosecute General Kaihura for torture, and uh, thugs were hired to beat us up at, at Makindi together with Nicolas Sofio and Yasin Kwako. I, I don't know how much money could be given to you to start that race. So the issue uh, which I don't want us to lose track of is that at the end of the day, these are legal issues. They may have political overtones, but there is a legal issue that court should handle, irrespective of who is attending for it. Thank you, George. Lawyer to the missing people. Lunch. We will go for lunch and come back at three. It's a long stretch, and we deeply apologize to the panel that was supposed to be starting now. So we'll just dash quickly 